yesterday Iraqi-held territory. They fired today as part of a huge artillery barrage, 60 batteries firing. However, so swift was the action across the whole front of the Allied assault that the British gunners found themselves almost ahead of the game. With a massive influx of troops and support vehicles chasing through the gaps in the sandbank defences, the gunners had encountered virtually no return fire. We've been stuck back there behind the Saudi burn for some time now, and to actually get moving forward and firing and chasing the enemy out is um, good for us. The morale's high, very high. The gunner's commander was well pleased. He said they had been in place, on time, and on target at all times. All day, Allied forces poured across, their carefully constructed battle plan roaring into place. British troops have a very clear-cut role in this offensive. The man commanding them, General Rupert Smith, was on the move. We encountered him at a location I cannot reveal, being briefed by his senior officers. This is the heart of the British battle operation. The general absorbing and handling the massive information flowing in a high-technology war. My first Audi border, Allied troops seemed free to roam. The skyline thick with every conceivable army vehicle. We drove for miles with only the occasional piece of rocket debris, giving evidence of warfare. As night falls on the first day of the ground battle, this former Iraqi-held territory is now filled with Allied vehicles. There are convoys on every horizon. There are some clusters of armoured vehicles digging in, and more are moving northwards, forward. And as we headed through what had been the Iraqi frontline positions, we came across Iraqis, but as prisoners of war, 160 of them, hungry, thirsty and tired, but happy, it seemed, to be prisoners of war. This is Kate Aidy with British First Armoured Division for the British Television News Pool. RAF Jaguars based in the Gulf of... And these pictures show the Marines making their way through the minefield, and one vehicle has clearly hit a mine and damaged its rear axle. But General Schwarzkopf said elsewhere the Allies ran into only light resistance. Part of this, of course, may be because much of the advance was not directed at Iraqi strongpoints. But they took prisoners in plenty. Against the background of burning Kuwaiti wells, literally hundreds of them were pictured streaming south. By early evening, the Allies were claiming 5,500 prisoners of war. But it's clear that that figure must be rising all the time. What's going on? Military gunners firing in support from firing points just inside Saudi Arabia. We've been stuck back there behind the Saudi burn for some time now, and to actually get moving forward and firing and chasing the enemy out is um, good for us. The morale's high, very high. My first impression. Is their satisfaction with the first day's progress on all fronts? And there's much relief that obstacles... I thought it'd be a lot tougher. But then again, it's not over yet either, so... I don't know. It's just not as, not as tough as I thought. I expected them to have uh, more artillery. I expected uh, more incoming. We really didn't see any. Uh, and and uh, that's both to bypass uh, the, the large uh, Iraqi garrison in Kuwait and I think to avoid uh, causing such heavy damage to Kuwait itself. Which had been intended to force tanks to expose their vulnerable underbellies to anti-tank fire when they mounted it. Yeah, the way will have been clear for the tanks to exploit the breakthrough into open country beyond leapfrogging each other, stopping when necessary to give covering fire. Their prime aim has been to destroy Iraqi tanks and blast away for the infantry to come through in their armoured personnel carriers. And they in turn will have been searching for Iraqi infantry, threatening Allied tanks with their anti-tank missiles. They'll have been trying to avoid close combat, trying instead to use the cannon mounted on the Bradley armoured personnel carriers. Swarming ahead and around the Allied advance, the Apache attack helicopter. Each helicopter carries 16 laser-guided Hellfire missiles whose targets are picked out by other planes, troops on the ground, or by the Apache itself. This means that the helicopter is able to stay outside the range of enemy fire while it's self-firing. Last night we were shown an Apache... Well, commander of the 7th Corps we've heard so much about today and a former vice chief of staff 
uh, of the US Army. General Crozen... Army's Shaheed or Martyrs Brigade. The stakes could not have been higher for these troops. Forced to abandon their country in August, they had to watch as the Iraqis plundered it. Uh, about Saddam Hussein... Now they expect to be in their capital tomorrow or within days. Their Iraqi foe has been humbled. It's to an early example of Muslim tenacity leading to victory, the 800-year struggle for Constantinople. Allied commanders hinted that this war would exploit the flexibility of modern armoured formations. They meant it. Only 70 hours into this operation, the scale of this huge left-handed sweep into Iraq... They'd advanced some 40 miles into Iraq, much of it at great speed, enjoying the luxury of complete security from air attack. At around dusk last night, they met their first opposition. An Iraqi armoured division dug in in prepared positions. The British briefing in Riyadh described the night battle that followed, and we've enlarged like the air cavalry as far north as this would complete the encirclement of Saddam's entire... It's called Lava Junior. 